Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, should government play a role in economic development? We'll hear from both sides of the issue. And we'll look at the Justice Department's new guidelines on enforcing federal marijuana laws. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Governor Brewer announced today that the state is appealing the denial of disaster assistance for the Yarnell Hill Fire. Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, determined that the severity and magnitude of the fire did not warrant additional federal aid. The governor maintained that the state should not be responsible for covering the variety of costs associated with the fire. The governor also says that FEMA didn't take into account the high number of poor and elderly residents impacted by the fire. Well, should government play a role in economic development, and if so, what kind of a role and how much should public officials offer incentives, including tax credits and special taxing zones? Tonight, we debate government's role in the private sector with Byron Schlomach of the Goldwater Institute, which advocates for less government in economic development. Also, here is Barry Broom of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, which supports the use of government tools to attract businesses to Arizona. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank so you. much for joining us. All right, what is government's role in economic development? Providing good roads, providing uh, essential infrastructure, uh, providing for a, a safe environment, public safety. Um, that's pretty much where it ought to end. Uh, at, at, I think there comes a point where government just needs to stay out of the, out of the way. Is that where it ends? Well, we agree with Byron. Government has a role of staying out of the way and certainly public safety and roads. But, you know, the the role of a, of a state government and a local metropolitan government is to make sure they have all the policies necessary to drive all the jobs and to drive those jobs in an equitable way, make sure that there aren't poor neighborhoods, make sure that the jobs have higher than normal wages, that they have export industry positions. And highly specialized uh, policies by the government can contribute significantly to communities' ability to do that. Why not let government in its own way, in a, in a strong way as opposed to a, a way that gets in the way of business, uh, why not let government stimulate economic development, do things to help push the process along? Well, look, anytime you do that, it involves a redistribution to certain favored industries. Um, and what that means is that you're taking tax money away from regular people, people working in other industries, possibly even uh, in, in companies that are in competition with the companies that you're trying to recruit and you're redistributing it to those to, to, to your favored companies it, it's it's there's a fairness issue I would argue there's a justice issue I would argue and I would also argue that look government doesn't always have uh, people in government people in economic development don't necessarily know the right way to go um, we have these examples with solar companies going bankrupt that have been supported by the federal government and state and local governments for that matter. Um, and it's because, quite frankly, government stepped in, encouraged these industries to grow faster than they should have. They weren't mature enough. Well, there's always mistakes in every bit of policy infrastructure, but what a lot of people don't realize when they start talking about incentives, in the case of Arizona with a company like SunTech or First Solar, you know, First Solar has built uh, a 1.2 million square foot plant, Mesa. They actually didn't receive any of their incentives, even though they were scheduled to so, because those incentives were performance-based. One of the things that uh, we've done in Arizona is all of our incentives are performance-based. So I think, you know, not all incentives are the same. There are scenarios in which incentives were a mistake. Solyndra would be an example of that with the federal government. But if you sit down and craft and construct the policy the correct way, uh, then these incentives can be done so that they're safeguarded and can drive higher than normal investment in a community. But, but, but what's the point? I mean, if you're, if you're going to meet certain performance standards, then that's usually a level at which that company is competitive anyway. And if First Solar hasn't shut its doors, but it hasn't met those goals, then what's the point of promising it to them in the first place? Um, it seems like to me that these kinds of incentives are more political 
than they are anything else. And I often call these incentives the, the, the funds that are set aside for this kind of purpose ribbon cutting funds because they're a great way to make news. And it is obvious that they're there. You don't, what you, what you miss is all the economic t activity that's lost because you've taken money away from people. Is there not an argument that w you would also miss all the economic activity in general if you don't attract the business here in the first place? Well, the way you attract business is with a good culture, uh, pro-business culture, uh, low taxes, um, an efficient government to, that provides necessary infrastructure, necessary uh, health and safety uh, benefits. Not, and, and we're not just talking about uh, police forces. We're talking about making sure that, uh, the, that you have a healthy environment. That's what attracts companies and jobs. Is that all that attracts companies and jobs? Well, you have to have that. But I, let's just take an example of, of an unknown success story in Arizona for incentives. That's the aerospace defense sector in this market and down in Tucson, which is the largest, most dynamic high wage export industry position in the state of Arizona. So Hughes Aircraft goes to Tucson, uh, you know, many, many years ago in competition with other markets. And Tucson provides free land, and the federal government provides a loan guarantee to Hughes Aircraft. Today, that's Raytheon. And if you look at Tucson today, uh, where would it be without Raytheon? Here in the valley, whether it's Boeing or Honeywell or uh, Lockheed Martin, um, all of these different aerospace defense industries got free land back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They got federal loan guarantees. They got tax credits. But they did a, they did, there were other things that Arizona did back in the days of Barry Goldwater and Paul Fannin. They gave them the right infrastructure. They passed, one of the reasons we were a right-to-work state, we were one of the very first right-to-work states, maybe the very first one in 1946, it was to lure aerospace defense companies out of California. We eliminated the inventory tax before most states did. So there was a situation where, you know, we made sure we had free market and management rights on the right-to-work side. We gave these companies good infrastructure. We, we also converted Arizona State University from a teaching school to an engineering school and a research school. Those were all good environmental decisions. But we were still in competition with 11 states for this industry. And we still had to engage in a targeted policy to take advantage of those advantages we did broadly. And I think it's been a big payday for Arizona. Talk about that scenario in general, and in particular the idea that this is how states and regions compete. Well, in providing infrastructure, if you have, if you have a potential employer who wants to move in and here's a plot of land, but you need a road built to it, I have no objection to providing basic infrastructure where there are opportunities. I don't have any particular objection to giving away land. We have, we're kind of lousy with land in this state to this day. And frankly, it needs to be converted to private ownership as much of it as we can possibly convert. Um, those aren't uh, the example of the inventory tax elimination. That's certainly not something I have an objection to. That's rational tax policy. Uh, we still, to this day, have an anti-business tax policy in this state with taxing business at a higher rate in the property tax, for example. Can incentives be constructed in such a way well enough to where you aren't picking winners and losers, as you referred to earlier? Right. I don't believe you can. Um, and it really boils down to politics. It boils down to who are the best advocates for their companies or for their industries. And look, lobbyists don't always tell the truth. Um, they they often go a little uh, a, a little too far with their stories. Well, is and is there a bias? Create the most jobs, get the most attention, get the better breaks. I mean, I think I think if you look at you know one of the big criticisms that I hear from people is you know there was a story that came out a year ago that. You know, GE didn't pay any federal taxes, or virtually no federal taxes. And I had a lot of people tell me how upset they were about that. And my question back to them on GE is, what was GE's tax impact to the federal government? You know, a staggering producer of tax impacts. So if you look at Intel, for instance, where we put in infrastructure, we just passed a bill to help them with infrastructure. We have an R&D tax credit that is for everyone in the state, but it's very important to Intel. 
Real and personal property taxes are, are eliminated uh, by a significant percentage, but Intel. Intel's investment activity is so dynamic in Chandler. Intel is still the largest taxpayer in Chandler. They pay more taxes to, to Chandler schools than any other business. And after the incentives on their last fab plant, you know, we projected that the state received $370 million in net new income. And we get research in $133,000 a year jobs and engineers. So there, you know, and then Intel has a procurement relationship with 1,700 small businesses in the uh, Arizona community. So, you know, there are some of these industries are the straw that stirs the drink, aerospace, Intel. Um, and, you know, there certainly are complexities with rolling out those strategies. Solar uh, has not reached its potential, but if you scrub underneath the uh, solar incentives, you know, the state did not take a big hit on that. The federal government did, though, to your point on, on Solyndra. And if you do them right and you pay attention to the policies the correct way, uh, you can drive higher than normal outcomes. And in order to have another generation of aerospace companies and another generation of Intels, we're going to have to engage in both what Byron is saying, public safety, grade schools, and infrastructure, but we're also going to have to have the policy infrastructure necessary to compete for these export industries because there's 50 other states that would like to have Intel too. But look, businesses, I've said for a long time, businesses do not pay taxes. Only people pay taxes. So what that, what that means is you don't favor a particular business because of that principle. You favor all businesses because of that principle. The reality is we in this state already overtax businesses. The solution isn't to go out and do selective uh, tax abatements for certain employers, especially the large ones who can afford the best lobbyists. The thing to do is to lower the taxes for all businesses and watch a thousand flowers bloom. The idea of government intervention meaning economic distortions, that projects that the free market may not accept in a totally free market just means that this is something that the market rejects and that whatever flowers are blooming, uh, you'd have even more flowers if you get rid of the incentives, let the market do its work. Valid? Well, here's the thing about incentives, first off. When we advocate for incentives, like the kind that have helped Intel expand in Chandler, we're not advocating for those for Intel. We're advocating for those for Chandler in East Valley in Arizona. So to me, when I talk about public policy incentives, it isn't something we give to a business. As Byron is saying, and he's right, all these businesses are global. They got great lobbyists. Um, if they don't get treated well in Arizona, they get treated really well in Alabama, Tennessee, Texas, and so on and so forth. So these are policies that you do to improve your community's position to grow their economy. So that's the first statement on incentives. The second statement, and this is about the market, and I'm glad you brought this question up. Sometimes if, if, you're, if you have my job, my job isn't to work the market. My job is to work the Valley and Greater Phoenix and convince the market to participate at a high level here so that we can have a prosperous community. Sometimes the market will say no to you, okay? And depending on how they say no, you have to make a decision as a community. And your decision is going to be, am, am I going to do something to compete and change this scenario? Or am I going to accept the fact that the market's saying no to me? Right now, if you're working in places like Chicago and Detroit, I know what the market's telling those places. Um, but those communities can't accept those outcomes, so they have to engage in a strategy to change. The market tells me that Arizona is a great place to play golf, recreate, have conventions, and build homes. I'm sending a message back to the market that we're far more dynamic than that. So the market conversation is a struggle for the community because the market outcome might not be one you can accept. Respond, please. I think incentives are a net negative. In fact, I read a paper, an academic paper not that long ago, about how um, where these economists looked at the economic outcomes in the congressional districts of congressmen who became chairman of committees, which generally means you get a lot more pork to take home. They found that, in fact, different, on a differential basis, those districts did not do that well economically. And they believe, they, it's hard to know exactly why that is, but they believe that it's because other corporations, corporations that those chairmen don't favor, avoid those districts because they would otherwise have to compete with those corporations in those areas. Now, I think there's a role besides a, providing infrastructure and education for government to play and for organizations like GPEC uh, in promoting 
a state and promoting an area and promoting our culture and promoting what we have and, and our, our uh, advantages. But I, going out and providing these tax incentives and such, that's a mistake. We have to stop it right there. Gentlemen, great discussion. Good Thank to have you, you both here. Thank you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at Arizona Horizon at ASU.edu. U.S. Justice Department announced last week that it will not file suit against states that allow for recreational marijuana use. Here to talk more about the Justice Department's new marijuana enforcement guidelines is Phoenix criminal defense attorney Bruce Fetter. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. What exactly did the Justice Department do? This is the second policy that the Department of Justice has issued in the last several years. It appear, appears to be a progression um, where recognizing that the states are engaged in the historically accepted um, experimental aspect that they are to look at societal problems and see if they can come across with a better way, that um, the Justice Department now says that they are going to not um, prosecute not only small users and, and sick people um, who need marijuana for their illnesses, but even for larger producers, so long as the states um, have comprehen comprehensive uh, rules and regulations that they enforce. So it's pretty much the federal government saying, we're going to have a hands-off policy and, and let the states do what they need to do. Is that a hard approval or a tacit approval? Far be it for me to, to look sure. into their minds and know what it is they're thinking. Um, the, the stated reason is, is, is to um, uh, present their resources on other problems, um, that this is not one that they need to spend money and time on. Indeed, it sounds like they're telling the states, you can do X, Y, and Z, just don't undermine our priorities and our guidelines when it comes to uh, distribution to minors, distribution to gangs, and these sorts of things. Is that, is that yeah, somewhat gave, accurate? Yeah, they gave, I think, seven or eight categories um, where they don't want um, uh, the states to allow people, such as mm -hmm. selling to minors or um, the money's going to criminal enterprises. They've kept back their ability to prosecute people using federal lands to either use marijuana or cultivate marijuana. So the state regulations have to be in place and have to be of such a strength where the feds say, keep them strong, keep them in place. What if you've got a state that doesn't have much in the way of regulations? It's always the devil is in the details. Um, this memo is not clear as to what criteria they're going to use as to whether or not a state um, has comprehensive regulations and whether or not a state is enforcing the, those regulations in a manner in which the DOJ thinks is appropriate. Is this something somewhat similar to immigration, the guidelines of immigration enforcement we saw coming out of justice? Um, same conceptual framework, I think, and that is um, drug enforcement um, is part of the federal government's uh, regulatory authority. They put drugs on the Controlled Substance Act. Um, I don't know if it's exactly the same because the states have sort of concurrent jurisdiction over whether or not they want to prosecute or, or uh, uh, Ill, uh, make illegal certain types of drugs. I asked a question because it sounds like the feds are almost saying you don't need to necessarily enforce federal law here or, or federal law doesn't necessarily have to be recognized as it stands. Here's our guidelines for well, it. Well, they're saying it's still illegal under federal law. Um, it's still illegal on federal lands. But again, they're going to allow this 
historically approved um, experimental laboratory in the States for them to see if maybe we should move away from the war on drugs and, and allow sick people, addicted people, and other people to use marijuana and not put so many people in prison, not give so many people criminal histories. What does it mean to Arizona's medical marijuana law? I, I think it gives authority for them to openly um, engage in the program and, and see how it works. I think it takes uh, certainly away any concerns that the governor expressed at some point in time about state officials that were involved in implementing this program being prosecuted. Indeed. Still against the law, but not open to prosecution or not a target of prosecution. So this policy statement yeah. says, I mean, there have been some prosecutions of dispensaries in California, for instance, since the uh, first policy statement was issued. So, What about the, the county's lawsuit against this one dispensary, I think, out in Sun City, which, again, the, the, the county attorney is saying you're asking for county officials to, you know, in a, in a public capacity to break the law. Uh, I think that's an appeals right now. But your thoughts on just, first of all, the argument, and secondly, does this set of guidelines now change that equation? I don't know that it changes it. Um, this is kind of a, everybody's sort of feeling their way along this. Um, you have a law in the books that says marijuana is illegal. It's a what's called a Schedule I drug under the Control of Substance Act, along with heroin, cocaine, et cetera. Um, and yet, the federal government is taking a step back um, and letting states see if there may be a better way um, to deal with marijuana as opposed to making it illegal, but just to make it some type of medication. This idea of, of the Justice Department with guidelines regarding federal laws, some of those guidelines including don't enforce those federal laws, is this unprecedented? Is it unusual? Have we seen this a lot in the past? Uh, don't ask, don't tell, I suppose is one, indeed, possi indeed. one possibility. I'm, I'm not sure I can think of another off the top of my head, but I, I think, again, the federal government um, has to enforce the law. But sometimes when they see a problem that maybe um, they feel that the law shouldn't be enforced as harshly as it might be, that they can take a step back and let the states uh, see if they can come up with a better way of dealing with things. We've seen criticism already of this, that the Attorney General is breaking the law, shirking his duties, I think, was uh, some of the things out there. Your thoughts, uh, again, on that? I know. You've kind of encapsulated it, but the idea of the actual chief law enforcement officer saying this and putting these guidelines, is there a shirking of duties going on here? Congress would have to, well, initially, the Drug Enforcement Administration would have to try to deschedule um, marijuana from Schedule 1 and either take it off or put it in another schedule where it could be prescribed as a medication. Um, that would come, and, and the Drug Enforcement Administration is part of the executive branch. So um, the executive branch, I think, is sending a message that ultimately Congress would have to answer is whether or not um, at this point in our history um, we've maybe made a mistake about marijuana and we need to move in a different direction. So I don't think he's shirking his responsibility. I think he is accepting his responsibility in times of budgetary distress um, is to put our resources toward other more pressing problems. Is this the kind of thing where folks who have been convicted of crimes involving marijuana possession, marijuana use, does that change the dynamic as far as their sentencing, as far as their cases are concerned? What goes on there? Unclear, unknown, to be continued. So, so there, is, there is a possibility, because we've all heard the stories of someone who is in possession in the third strike or whatever the case may be, getting decades in prison for possession of, of either marijuana or something else. Let's forget the something else. Let's stick with marijuana. This could change that dynamic, couldn't it? Well, it, it will definitely change it going forward. Yes. The question is, um, is it ever going to change um, the circumstances of those people who have already been convicted of marijuana offenses? And that, that's an unknown. Last question. Criminal defense attorney, uh, you represent someone who's been busted for possession of marijuana. I don't know how often that happens anymore, but you know, let's just say not in Colorado, not in Washington, here in Arizona. Uh, how do you approach a defense? Does, and does this guideline change things? Well, in Arizona, for first-time offenders and even second-time offenders, um, they are given an opportunity to enter into a diversion program where they attend classes and, and, and perform other task at, at something called TASC, T-A-S-C, where if they successfully complete, the charges are dropped. So 
in this particular circumstance, Arizona uh, was way ahead of the, the curve. Interesting stuff. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Take care. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, a five-year-old Arizona boy has been allowed to use medical marijuana. We'll hear from those for and against that decision, and we'll look at a new book that chronicles the history of African Americans in Tempe. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.